In this video, I'm going to talk about a major problem that the cryptocurrency space has to solve in order for this magical internet money experiment to actually work over the long term. Okay, I'm talking about this as a blockchain developer who works with this technology on a daily basis. Like, why you need to care about this and what some potential long-term solutions are for this problem. So, before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So, if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. So recently we saw a bunch of drama with Elon Musk, you know, coming out, talking about Bitcoin, and then the price subsequently, you know, going down quite a bit, you know, just from a few tweets that came out online. And you heard lots of people saying like, hey, this is a really big problem. If if one person can come out and just talk about this and the price can move, you know, so much, like how is this going to work over the long term? You have some people saying like, hey, that's not really very decentralized, is it? If you have this single point of failure. So decentralization is a huge part of blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, this entire space. It's what makes the actual experiment work in the first place. And I'm going to talk about a very specific part in which this technology has to be more decentralized for the price to not be affected quite as much as it is right now by what one person does and why you really need to care about decentralization over the long term because it's it's a trade-off. Some people say, oh, we don't care about decentralization. We just care about gains. Well, you will care about uh, decentralization when it affects the gains. We're going to talk about that more in this video. And I know some time has passed since the whole Elon drama went down, but let's talk about this price. The crypto space has definitely, you know, developed a love-hate relationship with Elon Musk. They love it when he says great things about Bitcoin, you know, buys $1.5 billion of Bitcoin for Tesla's balance sheet, makes the price go up like crazy. But then when he says something critical about it, uh, or even just talks about it in a way that people can interpret it as bad, and the price goes down really fast right after it happens, then this course is a problem. So how can this be solved? We talk about decentralization where basically, you know, the Bitcoin network needs more nodes in order to be decentralized so that no point of failure is there for the network, where the supply needs to be more decentralized, where not too, you know, not one person holds too much Bitcoin where they could like potentially tank the price based on when they buy or sell. But one last thing that we really need is we need the supply of Bitcoin to be more decentralized across the entire available amount of money out there that can buy Bitcoin, okay? And in one sense, we basically just need more Bitcoin adoption, more people to hold Bitcoin for this to become a problem because the price volatility of Bitcoin right now has got a lot to do with the market cap. So what do I mean by that? So the market cap is the number that says how much is all the Bitcoin in the world worth? Okay, so let's just, and the price is the unit price. So let's just say a Bitcoin is worth, you know, $50,000 for example's sake. And then the market cap is like $1 trillion. So basically, this is the unit price. This is how much one Bitcoin is. And this is how much the market cap is, uh, $1 trillion. And so when you have a market cap that's this small in the grand scheme of things, it still is subject to a good amount of price volatility. And that's why you see this also in other cryptocurrencies. When you go down in the market cap ranks, then these little low cap altcoin gems that people talk about online all the time can be so explosive. The market caps are a lot smaller. Let's say, you know, like 10 million, 100 million. When those coins coins are basically really low cap, then the price can move really fast in either direction. You know, you can make 10x gains in a really short time frame, whereas right now at this market cap level, it's really hard to make 10x gains in something like Bitcoin. But we can still see massive, you know, 20, 30% swings in either direction on Bitcoin based on, you know, some really small set of influences, okay? So earlier this year when the Bitcoin price went up a lot, you know, one of the big influences was institutional adoption of cryptocurrency. We talked about that a lot on this channel. Basically, major players were buying Bitcoin and you see the needle move in price really fast. I mean, the price of Bitcoin went up, you know, 5X over about a six month period. But still, even at this $1 trillion market cap level, if somebody says something good or bad about Bitcoin, it can move the price you know, 20, 30, 50% in either direction on a really short time scale. So what has to happen for Bitcoin to get out of this problem? Well, like I said, you know, the the market cap has to go up, but by how much? Well, let's use really rough examples. So if the Bitcoin market cap were to hit, you know, $10 trillion and be worth, you know, about $500,000 per Bitcoin, then the amount of influence that one person would have with this market would be way less. And a lot of people don't understand this, but this is like one of the visions for Bitcoin long term anyways, to actually be way less volatile in price and be a little bit more like a stable coin. People say, oh, Bitcoin can never be used as a currency, but that's part of like 
one way that Bitcoin could be used as a currency is if, if the market cap gets so big that the volatility is essentially negligible at that point. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily ever going to happen and that that's a good solution, but that's what some people think. And if you look at a report like this, uh, it's from Cane Island Digital Research, you can look at like technology adoption in U.S. households like 1903 to 2019, and you can see like how long each... Um, you know, each different piece of technology took to take off, like a vacuum cleaner, refrigerator, electric power radio, all that type of stuff. You know, some stuff took a while. And some of this is got an indication of like where we were at that point in history and how fast new technology comes out of the scene and gets adopted. But you can see like how fast these curves move uh, and that these things get adopted much faster at the later points in history here. A lot of that's got to do is just how consumers adopt new technology. There's lots of factors in this for sure. But if you could draw us with crypto, like crypto might look like almost a vertical wall in comparison to these other technologies. And so they talk about what a maximum theoretical price could be for Bitcoin, you know, in here, which could be something like 1 million to 10 million US dollars. So that's a theoretical maximum. It's not saying that this Bitcoin price is going to get there and it's going to get there like tomorrow or anytime soon. But they're talking about this, that Bitcoin adoption curve uh, path follows a very similar path to that of internet adoption. Both functions can be modeled using this curve right here that I can't really pronounce. <laughs> and also the theoretical maximum apply does not incorporate the possibility of negative events, all that type of stuff that we talk about on this channel. But if we have that type of adoption where Bitcoin actually permeates a broader market, then we can see more decentralization of Bitcoin holdings and make the pie actually bigger. And that would bring this market cap up to the level that it needs to escape this problem where like one person can come in and just have an opinion and sway the price of Bitcoin so much in any direction. And that would make Bitcoin way less volatile as an asset to where you can see the sustainable price level or you know just slower growth. Now, that being said, this is a double-edged sword because right now when there's all this volatility in cryptocurrencies, that's that's actually an indication of when the opportunity actually exists. So if you're getting into cryptocurrencies while it's still early and it's volatile, like the fact that one person can, you know, move the needle on the price significantly in any direction is an indication that it's still early, that there's still opportunities on the table. Of course, it's not financial advice, but when the market cap gets really big and there's no more volatility anymore and Bitcoin can't grow really fast, then it's hard to see the types of gains that we do right now. So while it is a double-edged sword that, you know, one person can do this, the other thing is that there's still a lot of upside left on the table for the asset class itself. And so now I want to talk more about decentralization and why it's important, because I talk about that a lot on this channel. You know, I'm a blockchain developer. I work with the Ethereum protocol. And one of the reasons I'm so bullish on Ethereum and so big on this space in general is because decentralization is one of the core values. And Ethereum is the most credibly neutral decentralized platform where you can actually create dApps or decentralized applications that people are using right now, like with decentralized finance, for example. So we've seen lots of people move from Ethereum to things like Binance Smart Chain, for example, which is a lot less decentralized. So let me talk about, you know, why decentralization is so important because people say like, oh, people don't care about decentralization. They just care about gains. But that's what I saw about earlier in the video that people actually do care about decentralization when it affects their gains. So this is one way where you see one person can come in and just move the needle uh, in the wrong direction. Then your gains go away because the decentralization of the supply and the market cap's not there. So talking about other use cases for blockchain technology. So we're talking about, you know, a network itself being decentralized where nodes that run the network are spread across the globe. Well, those nodes aren't, you know, as vulnerable to regulators shutting down that network if illegal activity were to ever happen on the blockchain because it's decentralized across all these different countries and it'd be really hard to enforce that type of regulation. But if you have a more centralized blockchain that only has like, you know, a handful of validators that mostly run in one area, or you have somebody who has a significant amount of control of those validators, and then all your money exists on those networks and a regulator can come in and shut it down, then well, you will care about decentralization because your gains will completely go away. That's kind of the argument that I'm talking about. People say, oh, people leaving Ethereum because of the fees, all this kind of stuff. Well, the fees are an indication of demand. So people aren't leaving it. But you do see people going to other blockchains that are more centralized that essentially try to solve Ethereum scalability issues by just compromising on decentralization. But if those ever get regulated, well, then, you know, your money could just be shut down at any time. So another thing is the applications themselves. So the Ethereum based applications, let's take like Uniswap, for example. Well, Uniswap is powered by smart contracts. They're put on the blockchain. And once they're on the blockchain, they can't really be chained. And so you see this problem a lot with other cryptocurrency exchanges, like centralized cryptocurrency exchanges versus decentralized cryptocurrency exchanges. Let's say you put your money on a centralized cryptocurrency exchange that didn't require any KYC. They didn't re require you to upload your ID or give you any personal details or for you to have any, give them any personal details in order to sign up for an account. And then a regulator comes in and says, hey, 
Like you're you're running an exchange with no KYC on it. We're going to shut you down. And then you had your funds on that exchange. Well, your funds could completely go away. So that's one way in which centralization really does uh, affect your gains or the lack of decentralization. So let's contrast that to Uniswap. When I was talking about, you know, putting smart contracts in the blockchain. But once they're on the blockchain, people can't really tell you, like, like a regulator can't come in and just turn the smart contracts off. They can't turn the blockchain off that it runs on. We talked about that. You can't turn the smart contracts off because now they're on this blockchain. Now, of course, you know, regulators could come in and prosecute the people who created them. But for you, the end user, like if you're using the funds in your wallet and you're trading with these smart contracts, there's nothing about that once it's out there that can really affect you as the end user. And so that's one way that decentralization is really important and why you should care about it because it can affect your gains or lack of decentralization can definitely affect your gains. And so that's why we're going to drive home this point is decentralization is really important for this technology to succeed over the long term in every aspect for networks to be decentralized, for their nodes to run across the globe, be less prone to regulators for the supply of the cryptocurrencies that power these networks like Bitcoin for not too, one person to hold too much Bitcoin for the market cap to be bigger, de- be more decentralized in terms of capturing the overall money supply to where like, you know, one person can't just, you know, move the needle on the cryptocurrency too much based upon what they say. And for these applications to be more decentralized where, you know, your funds aren't going to get compromised by someone else's outside influence. So this is a theme that permeates everything that you should really care about if you care about the success over the long term. A lot of people here for short term gains say, oh, I don't care about that. You know, I just care about the gains. Well, your gains can be compromised if you don't take decentralization seriously. And that's one of the main reasons I want to make this video to drive this point home. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm that really helps these videos out so more people can learn about blockchain. If you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. If you like those and you went to the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I should become a blockchain master step by step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.